start spreading the news. I need them today. I want to be a part of it. New York, New York. New York, the city that never sleeps, the city that doesn't stop growing, and the city that never dies. When you hear the word city, your brain goes straight to thinking about the tall skyscrapers, the lawn traffic jams, and the taxis that paint the city black and yellow. This American phenomenon has been through a lot in its vast history. Terrorist attacks, gang warfare, and slavery have formed the city into what it is seen today. There was a big monkey whack down planes at the top of the empire that skipped over it. New York is beautiful. And it's a good example of a thriving city. Life there is like no other, and it's clear to see why many people chose to make a future there. New York is known to be home to many nationalities and ethnicities, being one of the four to have 10% of the four major ethnicities living amongst its scrapers. All the tall boys must put life into perspective that we are very small compared to everything else. So why should we fight? Why don't we work together and build a global hub of diversity? I do like New York's attitude. Hello everyone, I am Lewis, you are watching Lost in Travel, and I am back from our World Explained, where today we are going to be discussing the origins of the Big Apple. New York has always been important in movies, TV shows and pop culture, but what made the city ahead of its time? Please sit back, relax, and I'm going to break down New York's history in this two-part mini-series. This episode will discuss the first settlers to this New York world, the creation of Brooklyn Bridge and the Statue of Liberty, along with the opening of Times Square, the assassination of President William McKinley, and the importance of the New York subway. And no, not the sandwich kind. Even though that does look rather tasty. Alright, let's roll! <laughs> roll that! Intro and let's start explaining New York. New York City is the third place to be explored via World Explained. However, being the first non British is the only thing differentiating in this one from the others. I technically say a non British is wrong also, because how was the United States formed? Lots of Europeans moving over to start a life in the New World, with many of them being British and Irish. But anyways, the big difference is that Edinburgh's and London's history goes way back. Their history for is as far away as the dinosaurs that is as far away to New York's history. Huge exaggeration, I know, but instead of starting the BC digits, we will begin our timeline explanation in 1524. This is the year that explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano first set foot in the land that will be known as New York City in the modern era. Giovanni de Verrazzano was born around 1485 near Val de Grave, 30 miles south of Florence, Italy. Around 1506 or 1507, he began pursuing a maritime career, and in the 1520s, he was sent by King Francis I of France to explore the east coast of North America for a route to the Pacific. He made landfall near what would be Cape Fear, North Carolina, and early March and heading north to explore. On his adventure north, he happened to stumble across New York Harbour in 1524, and as a reward, for finding what would become one of the liveliest places in the world, he got a bridge named after it. So all of you New Yorkers have him to fan. Verrazzano travelled to the Americas two times after his expedition. On his final time in 1528, he was killed and eaten by cannibal natives which is reported to be on Guadalupe. In case they never wanted their lands to be owned by these unusual fellas from the other side of the Atlantic. Another famous explorer that shaped New York City in its early history would be the one and only Henry Hudson. Hudson was believed to be born in the late 16th century in England and went on to become one of the biggest explorers this world has seen. Good thing he was a failure at the start of his tenure as he made two unsuccessful voyages to Asia. Therefore, the Dutch East India Company had no other choice but to send them to the New World in 1609. This was a major success. 
and a career revival for Hudson. He spent his life trying to find different routes to Asia and instead his life is famous for embarking to the Americas. His most notable adventure to the New World was the second time when he came across the river which is nowadays known as the Hudson River. It is so ironic that his name is on plenty of New York streets, schools and bridges as there's actually little information on the guy. In 1625, the Dutch colony did situate their new Amsterdam in the mouth of the Hudson. His efforts also have drive European interests in North America, so I guess bums up to this guy. Also, why does New York like to name their big explorers on everything? Verrazano gets a bridge, Hudson gets a river, Liberty got a statue, Subway got a subway, oh damn it I'm hungry again. Moving on. I've just realised I forgot to tell you all that New York wasn't actually known as New York just yet. There was only an old York in England, aging with each passing Yorkshire pudding. This part of America was actually owned by the Dutch, as the area was known as New Netherlands. Very original, I know. The capital was also known as New Amsterdam. This was the early version of copy and paste as you can see. This was until 1625, when the Dutch governor Peter Stuyvesant surrendered the capital to Colonel Richard Nichols. The Dutch did try to keep their precious New Amsterdam away from the English, however with a faulty governor there was no doubt that the English would finally gain control. Even though the settlement did switch leaders multiple times in 1625, this was the first time it was considered to be called New York. This is actually in honour of the Grand Old Duke of York who organised the mission. So he literally did march 10,000 men up to the top of the hill and march them back down again. When looking at USA history, you can't dwell over the biggest war on American turf. The American Revolutionary War of 1775 to 1783. This was the first time America was united and decided they wanted to be original. They didn't want to be a new anything anymore. They were American. Not British. Not English. Not European. They were American. Yeehaw! Due to growing tension on the matter, April 1775 saw a full scale war over the country. France was a bit jealous that Britain was having all the fun and got involved in the colonist sides in 1778. This was when the Civil War turned into an international conflict. Nearly three months after the Treaty of Paris was signed ending the American Revolution, the last British military position in the United States. After the last wave came to Part 8, New York, the US General George Washington entered the city in triumph to the cheers of New Yorkers. He deserved his place on Mount Rushmore and he deserved to become the first president of the United States. He was a bald eagle in shoes and portrayed the American dream of might and pride. The states of America were united and there was nothing going to change that. Four months after the American Revolution, New York was made the USA's first capital city. In 1789, George Washington got his presidency coronation there and it remained to be the capital until 1790 when Philadelphia, not the cheese kind but the city, got made capital under the US Constitution. Washington DC is considered the capital of the country nowadays. In January 1997, Albany became the capital of New York State. Let's now move into the 19th century, which was an inventive time for America and also the world. This era saw the creation of the telephone, it saw the beginning of the light bulb and the camera. It also saw the first steamboat go across the Hudson River. Claremont, also known as the North River Steamboat, was designed by American engineer Robert Fuller, built in New York City by Charles Brown. I wonder if he could do the Charlie Brown. And it was backed financially by Robert Livingston. The steamboat was 133 feet long and 12 feet wide and a draft of 2 feet. Engines built by Matthew Bolton and James Watt in England drove the two side paddle wheels, each of which were 13 feet in diameter. On this first voyage, August 17th, 1807, the Claremont average was to 5 miles per hour for the 150 miles up the Hudson River to Albany. The Claremont inaugurated the first profitable venture in steam navigation, carrying paying passengers between Albany and New York City. I wonder if Mickey Mouse has ever whistled his way around the Hudson. Finally, by the time Fulton died in 1815, he had successfully created 17 steamboats and his plans were used by other shipbuilders half a dozen times. He was inspirational to say the least. Now let's move on to a topic which isn't a joking matter. So if I'm not funny for a while, not like I'm funny anyways, it's because this is serious Lewis talking. Here we go. 
As most of us know, the Nuremberg and origins of the state is due to see that the country was full of slavery, death and turmoil. The land was taken from the natives and bought by Africans who were tortured and imprisoned as slaves. Whereas the Europeans had moved over were the ones getting richer. Racism and slavery has infected the country and still exists today. Reasons for the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, the systematic enslavement of the African people started in New York City as a sad fact as part of the Dutch slave trade. The Dutch West India Company imported 11 African slaves to New Amsterdam in 1626, with the first slave auction held in New Amsterdam in 1655. With the second highest proportion of any city in the colonies after Charleston, South Carolina, this is more than 42% of New York City's households holding slaves by 1703, where they are often uh, being used as domestic servants and labourers. Others worked as artisans on enchantment in various trades in the city. Slaves were also used in farming on Long Island and the Hudson River in this Mohawk Valley region. I could make a joke there about, you know, Mohawk Valley, but I'm not going it. Just not a usual place I haven't heard of before. That's all. British troops occupied the Big Apple in 1776 with the American Revolution. The Crown promised freedom to slaves who left rebel masters and therefore thousands moved to the city for refuge. This meant that by 1780 there were 10,000 black people living in New York City. After the war, about 3,000 of them were evacuated to Nova Scotia and Canada to resettle where they were known as black loyalists. By 1790, one in three blacks living in the New York state were free. That is still horrible and certainly not equality for all. This number has to be free out of free. However, it was going to take much longer to sway the state's opinion. The, the free black people organised to work in independent communities with their own churches, etc., proving that they can do the same business and stuff as the white men. However, it was going to take some time to abolish slavery. Even with a movement in the late 1790s, slavery was important to the state economically, and it was proven to be difficult to get rid of this financial riser. In 1799, legislation was finally granted which passed the Act for the gradual abolition of slavery. It declared that children of slaves born after July 4th, 1799, to be legally free, but it saw that the service extended period of indentured servitude, which was 28 for a man and 25 for a woman. Despite this, anyone who was a slave prior or born before July 4th, 1799, would remain in an unpaid labour, but they just couldn't be sold. Even though this was still heartless, it was certainly progress and better than nothing. It is known as a gradual abolition of slavery after all. From 1800 to 1827, white and black abolitionists worked to end slavery and attained full citizenship in New York. During this time there was a rise in white supremacy, which was at odds with the increased anti-slavery efforts of the early 19th century. Peter Williams Jr., an influential black abolitionist and minister, encouraged other blacks to, by a strict obedience and respect to the laws of the land, form an invulnerable bulwark against the shafts of malice, to build the trust of freedom and a better life. Other anti-slavery activists were encouraged by children still being placed in apprenticeships even after the borough was free. On July 5th, 1827, the African American community celebrated final emancipation in the state with a parade through New York City. Oh boy, doesn't the city love a parade? July 5th was chosen because July 4th is considered to be a celebratory day for the blacks. As Frederick Douglass stated in his famous Walk to the Slave is the 4th of July speech of July 5th, 1852. Of all the northern states, New York was the second last to abolish slavery, holding on to it until its final grasp. This is quite morally disgusting, but this is the horrible side to history. And it is actually there as a stepping stone and proof that we don't want to be like the ancestors before us. We need to make the change. And vandalism and conflict and protest won't do any of that. Learn from this, understand from this, and make the change. Alright, let's now move on to a more positive side of New York's history. New York City has many bridges connecting the city, such as George Washington, Spovet and Duval Rail, Henry Hudson, Broadway, Universal Heights, Washington, Alexander Hamill, and High Bridge, McCombs Dam, 145th Street, Madison Avenue, Park Avenue, Ford Avenue, Wallace Avenue, Trevor, Wards Island, Pedestrian, Roosevelt Island, Queensboro, Williamsburg, Manhattan, and <gasps> Brooklyn Bridge, only to name a few. Or wait, <laughs> all 21 bridges. Let's discuss the latter.
Brooklyn Bridge opened on the 24th of May 1883, which was the first fix possible for the East River. It was also the longest suspension bridge in the world at the time of its opening, until Warrensburg Bridge was introduced in 1903. With a main span of 1,595.5 feet and a deck located at 127 feet above mean high water, the span was originally called the New York and Brooklyn Bridge or the East River Bridge, but was officially renamed the Brooklyn Bridge in 1915. This isn't named after an eagle called Brooklyn and instead is just simpler to describe the cross between the districts of Manhattan and Brooklyn. Now the bridge vastly increased the city's economy. Hi Brooklyn, just to know if you got the $300 I sent over to your only fans. Thanks, love you. <laughs> Sorry about that guys. No worry. Oh yes, Brooklyn Bridge. John A. Roblin designed the plans for the proposed construction, which was in consideration since the early 1800s. His son, Washington Roblin, oversaw the construction and contributed further design work, assisted by the latter's wife, Emily Warren Roblin. Due to problems and controversies in the novelty of this dream bridge, construction began in 1870 and took 13 years to complete. The people who own the bridge still can't make up their mind as the bridge has been altered and redeveloped over time. Full renovation has happened multiple times since opening such as in the 1950s, 1980s and the 2010s. The New York and Brooklyn Bridge was opened for use on May 24th, 1883. Thousands of people attended the opening ceremony and many ships were present in the East River for the occasion. Officially, Emily Warren Roblin was the first to cross the bridge. The bridge opening was also attended by the US President Chester A. Arthur and New York Mayor Franklin Edison, who crossed the bridge and shook hands with Brooklyn Mayor Seth Lowe at the Brooklyn End. If this happened today, it would have to be done with an elbow, you know? Elbow bumps are always a great way to show respect among them, aren't they? Huh? Yeah. Anyways, Abraham Hewitt gave the principal address. It is not the work of any man or of any one age. It is the result of the study, the experience and of the knowledge of many men in many ages. It is not merely a creation, it is a growth. It stands before us today as the sum and epitome of human knowledge as the very heir of the ages. As the latest glorious century or of patient observation, profile study and accumulated skill, gained step by step, the never ending struggle of man to subdue the forces of nature to his control and use. Though Washington Roblin was unable to attend the ceremony and rarely visited the site again after he built it, he held a celebratory banquet at his house on the day of the bridge opening. Come to think of it, Americans always eat to commemorate something. A bridge opening? Let it see. Gain our independence? Let it see. I'm bored? Guess I should eat then. All our festivities take place on launch day would be a performance by a band, gunfire from ships and a firework display. On that first day, a total of 1,800 vehicles and 150,300 people crossed the span. Less than a week after the Brooklyn Bridge opened, ferry crews reported a sharp drop in patronage. While the bridge's toll operators were processing over 100 people a minute, there was actually no need for ferries travelling back and forth. However, cross river ferries still continued to operate until 1942. The bridge had cost $15.5 million in 1883 American dollars to build, which in today's money is about $411,589,000 dollars. Of which Brooklyn paid two thirds of this very, very expensive date with Manhattan. Anyways, the bonds to fund the construction will not be paid off until 1956. I previously mentioned that there was a few controversies against the Brooklyn Bridge. Well, one of them was due to an estimated number of 27 people dying during the making of Brooklyn Bridge. Furthermore, at the time of opening, shockingly, the bridge was even ready for action. The construction was still unfinished, and with something having to carry vehicles and humans over war, this was ultimately dangerous, and you would have thought would have been better planned. And on May 30th, 1883, 60s after the opening, a woman followed down a steep 
experiment that blew my up was caused a staff beat, which resulted in at least 12 people being crushed and killed. In subsequent lawsuits, the Brooklyn and British company was acquitted of negligence. However, guys, no need to worry because the British have emergency phone boxes and additional railways installed after this event. There was also a fireproof plan enforced. Safety was certainly key. Another way they tried to build people's trust in the bridge not falling apart was by having a pretty spectacular event take place on May 17th, 1884. Circus master P.T. Barnum led his most famous attraction, Jumbo the Elephant Parade, over the 1.5,000 feet bridge. This consisted of 21 elephants scaling the construction, thus proving if elephants can do it, so can you. Another national historic landmark in New York which was created in the 19th century was the Statue of Liberty, Liberty, Liberty! Liberty, 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 Liberty! Has anyone else seen that American EMU advert? That was a reference to that, by the way, which I think to rather amusing. Anyways, the idea of this monument was proposed by French anti-slavery society president Edouard René de Liberty. Probably not pronouncing that right, but oh well, my French isn't as good as it used to be. This was during a late evening dinner conversation between himself and sculptor Frederick where Lebele stated, If a monument should rise in the United States as a memorial to their independence, I should think it only natural if it were built by united effort, a common work of both our nations. Today, the Statue of Liberty remains as an enduring symbol of freedom and democracy, as well as being one of the world's most recognisable landmarks. However, it took some time to get built in. Financial problems were aborted and therefore worked on the start until 1875. Before his massive creation, titled Statue of Liberty and Light in the World, depicted a woman holding a torch in her raised right hand and a tablet in her left, upon which was engraved July 4th, 1776, the adoption date of the Declaration of Independence. The face was reportedly based on the most democratic, peaceful and inspirational person today, the full day's monarch. Eiffel Tower designer Alexander Gustav Eiffel was told that he not get the skin and body looking realistic. Now this is a whole new meaning of phone a friend. The Iron Pilot and Copper Skin was designed in a way which resists the strongholds of the New York Harbour. While work went on in France on the actual statue, fundraising efforts continued in the United States with the pedestal including contest benefits and exhibitions. Near the end, the leading New York newspaper man, Joseph Pulitzer used his paper, The World, to raise the last necessary funds. Designed by the American architect Richard Morris Hunt, the statue's pedestal was constructed inside the courtyard of Fort Wood, a fortress built from the War of 1812 and located on Bedloe's Island off the southern tip of Manhattan in the upper New York Bay. In 1885, Bartholdi completed the statue, which was disassembled, packed in more than 200 crates and shipped to New York. Arriving that June like the biggest jigsaw in the man, which if you want to know is a memorable Disney moments jigsaw puzzle of 40,000 pieces. On October 28th, 1886, President Grover Cleveland officially dedicated the Statue of Liberty for thousands of spectators. This statue does not represent the nation, but was also people have been a guide to see us until 1901, as its torch lit up, navigating their way to the bay. Hey, I just done a rhyme! Not of it to mention is that due to the extreme elements of the New York outdoors, the copper skin was exposed to the oxidation which gave it a distinct green colour for a while during the early 20th century. In 1984, the statue was closed to the public and underwent a massive restoration in time for its centennial celebration. During this time, it became a world heritage site. London has Trafalgar Square, Budapest has Cedar Square, lots of other countries have squares. So what does New York have? Sounds cool if you're into lame repeated dancing, but I can't be it. Oh, it must be Watch Square. What? It isn't? Eventually. Alright then, this video is probably going on way too long, so please just tell me what this heckin' square is called. What's the time anyways? What? What's the time square? Nah, that, that, that's definitely wrong. Oh! Time Square! I knew that. Did you know that it hasn't always been known as Times Square? 
Currently, this area of Arkham is Lawn Acre Square, named after London's Cars District. In the late 1880s, Lawn Acre Square was considered a large open space surrounded by drab apartments. Soon, however, the neighbourhood began to change. Electricity in the form of theatre advertisements and streetlights transformed the public space into a safer, more inviting environment. The name changed to Times Square when the New York Times Newspaper Company moved their headquarters to Lawn Acre in January 1905. Times Tower at the time was the city's second tallest building. Ox, owner and publisher for the Times from 1896 to 1935, told the Cynicals Herald, I am pleased to say that Times Square was named without any effort or suggestion on the part of the Times. Yet he clearly felt proud. The new building represented the first successful effort in New York to give architectural beauty to a skyscraper. Within a decade, the Times outgrew their space and moved to a new location. Despite this, a tradition continued in the square, the New Year's Eve Spectacular. So the New Year's Eve Spectacular was done in the Times Square because Ox believed that the area was one of the most futuristic parts of the same. And where else should you bring the future? Lastly, even though the Times without the square, Times Tower still remains in the square to commemorate its origin. Next up, one of the biggest and most drastic events to take place in the city would be the assassination of President William McKinley. William McKinley was the 25th president of the good old US of A and served from 1897 up to his assassination in 1901. McKinley is notable for leading the Americans to victory during the Spanish American War of 1898. He also raised protective tariffs to promote American industry and kept the nation from the gold standard in the rejection of the expansionary monetary policy of free silver. McKinley enjoyed meeting the public. This type of love song quickly became a president of the people. However, his colleagues and representatives feared over his publicity stunts due to prior assassinations such as Ken Unbearable the first of Italy in 1900. After two days scheduled due to the protection of the common anarchists in Europe, McKinley had enough and demanded the speaker from his citizens on September 5th, 1901. This address was done in New York City in front of 50,000 people. In his final speech, McKinley urged reciprocity treaties with other nations to assure American manufacturers access to foreign markets. He intended the speech as a keynote to his plans for a second term. However, fortunately for the 25th president, he didn't know that one man in the crowd called Leon Zolkos lurked ready to end his life. Leon was supposed to the president's podium, but awaited the present moment as he was scared of missing and failing his objective. He was inspired by a speech in Cleveland by anarchist Emma Goldman to further his cause. Leon believed McKinley was head of a corrupt government, and getting him out of the picture would just erase the corruption. He failed to get the job done during his speech and went with Plan B, which saw him resort to wait in the following day at the Temple of Music on the exposition grounds that the president was to meet the public again. So Goss concealed his gun in a handkerchief, and when he reached the head of the line, he shot McKinley twice in the abdomen. Emotionally, McKinley was pronounced dead at 2.15am on September 14th, surviving a week after the attack. Rapidly, Theodore Roosevelt was rushing in to act as a president on the same exact day. And if you're going to happen to assassinate or Leon Zuckel, don't fret, as he was found guilty, sentenced to death on September 26th, my birthday by the way, and executed by an electric chair on October 20th, 1901. Roosevelt would then become the 26th president of the United States. And you're more likely to know it from the Night in the Museum movie, played by Robin Williams. The following years of the introduction to New York's first skyscraper of many skyscrapers. The flat iron building, originally the Fuller Building, is a triangular 22 story, 285 foot tall steel frame landmark building located at the 175th Avenue in the Flatiron District neighborhood of the borough of Manhattan in New York City. Designed by Daniel Burnham and Frederick Dinkelberg, it was the tallest building in the city upon its 1902 completion made for the purpose of being offices. Funnily, the name Flat Iron is derived from its resemblance to a cast iron clothes iron. Who would have looked at this building and thought, oh, I can iron my clothes and bed sheets with that? The building, which has been called one of the world's most iconic skyscrapers and a quintessential symbol of New York City, became a national New York City landmark in 1966 and became a national historic landmark in 1989. The flat iron building is remarkable for being used as the Daily Bugle in Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man movies, so if you have any pictures of Spider-Man, you know where to go. 
last noteworthy mention in this jam-packed world explained will be the introduction to the New York subway. With the addition of the bun being toasted and plenty of sausage to choose from, this fact will get you drooling for more. Oh damn it! Not that subway! The New York City subway is a rapid transit system that serves four of the five boroughs of New York City, New York, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan and Queens. Its operator is the New York City Transit Authority which is controlled by the Metropolitan Transportation Authority of New York. The first underground line opened on October 27, 1904, almost 35 years after the opening of the first elevated line in New York City, which became the IRT 9th Avenue line. Nowadays, underground is seen as one of New York's most cultured and artistic areas with many buskers doing performances down below. In 2016, an average of 5.66 million passengers used the system daily, making it the busiest rapid transit system in the United States and the seventh busiest in the world. Now, go get me a subway, because I'm starving. Anyways, there you have it. New York's been partly explained and much more detail and information will be discussed in the second part. This will include the construction of the Empire State Building, the origins of the I Heart NYC slogan and the devastating 9-11 terrorist attack. New York is a vastly growing city and deserves appreciation it receives. If you enjoyed learning about this then please give this video a like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay tuned to the next one explained and leave a comment if you have ever visited the city. I have only ever set foot in JFK for a transfer flight to Florida, which means I've only ever actually saw four New York City taxis with my own eyes. And unfortunately, it was a gloomy day and the sky was only a silhouette in the fog. But I'd love to explore eventually. Anyways, it is now time for me to say goodbye and I will be back with the next New York City Explained in two weeks time. See you all there. Ciao! And I'm being serious. Somebody go get me a subway. They come fly away with me. Imagine all the things that we could see. Yeah, don't you know that life's a dance? Come take my hand and fly.